Welcome to Making the Case. I'm Yorita Walde. 83-year-old Justice Stephen Breyer formally announced his retirement today, paving the way for President Biden to make history by nominating the first black woman to the U.S. Supreme Court. The president wasted no time in repeating his campaign promise. Take a listen. While I've been studying candidates' backgrounds and writings, I've made no decision except one. The person I will nominate will be someone with extraordinary qualifications, character, experience, and integrity. And that person will be the first black woman ever nominated to the United States Supreme Court. It's long overdue in my view. Three women are presumed to be on Biden's shortlist. California Supreme Court Justice Leandra Kruger, who once served as a law clerk for former Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens, has also argued before the high court as acting deputy solicitor general under the Obama administration. Uh, there's Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, another former Supreme Court clerk for Justice Breyer. She worked as an assistant federal public defender. She was confirmed in June to the powerful D.C.-based Court of Appeals by all the Senate Democrats and three Republican senators. And U.S. District Court Judge J. Michelle Childs, whose nomination to that same D.C. appeals court is still pending, she has the support of Democratic Congressman Jim Clyburn, who was instrumental in delivering the black vote and the White House for Biden in 2020. Joining me now from Washington is trial attorney and crisis manager Monique Presley. Monique, great to have you on tonight. Listen, as soon as word of Breyer's retirement came out and it became evident that the president would be selecting a black woman to replace him, there were questions concerning the qualifications of, of these potential nominees, whether they were qualified enough for the job. Now, we see this sort of thing happen often with black candidates, specifically women, who are poised for positions of power, but we're usually the ones who come highly credentialed and experienced. So why are they playing with this, Monique? Oh, well, Yodi, I mean, you know why. It's the same thing that it's always been, and I don't see that changing soon. Now, I must confess that any time there is a Supreme Court nominee, maybe it's because I'm a lawyer myself and come from that background, I always look at, critique, question the qualifications of the person who's being nominated. I make no assumptions, and I have been sorely disappointed any number of times, especially at the appointees in the past uh, four years in the Trump administration and any number of times before that, including the second black man who is now sitting still on the Supreme Court. Um, so I think that expecting them to be highly qualified is standard. I think that questioning their qualifications because of their blackness is wholly unacceptable. We do have to do more, go farther, faster, longer, quicker, stay, stay longer, uh, show all of our acumen in order to get anywhere. So it can always be assumed that if a black woman has attained any position of power, oh, she's supposed to be there. She's, she's, she's badassery as I say, and get in trouble every time I come on your show talking about black women. <laughs> Listen, Monique, um, representation does in fact matter. We don't just say it lightly. I mean, it, it's true. And as black women, um, you know, our voices have not been appreciated or heard. Um, our perspectives have not been valued. Representation, again, matters on all levels of government, but specifically here, having a black woman sitting on the Supreme Court, how will our legal system be better for it? Well, listen, this country was built on our backs and nobody is going to dissuade me of that or keep me from saying it. We have as much of a vested interest as anyone or more than anyone who could possibly sit on that court. The issues that are in front of the court um, directly disproportionately affect us, our children, our husbands, our mothers, we're looking at not just hot burners like uh, Roe v. Wade or like affirmative action. We're looking at maternal mortality issues. We're looking 
at unemployment mm -hmm. um, and employment wages and the disproportionate uh, wages between women and men, and then all the more so between women and black women. So these are all things that we need people on the court who don't just see it from afar. It's not something that they've just heard of. These need to be issues that have been touched and felt in their environment. And that is something that um, has been sorely lacking. And it is an unexcusable neglect, the fact that there has been no Black woman thus far. But I am glad that President Biden is honoring his promise to the one group that ensured that he got in office and doing right by us with this nomination. Monique, what about credibility? The Supreme Court, you know, has struggled with with being viewed as credible, especially in recent years, because it's viewed as being partisan. And of course, some of the rulings are questionable. So could some of that credibility be restored by adding a black woman justice? Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, the balance of the court is not going to change, which is why it's a little absurd, like all of the theatrics that the Trumplicans and the GOP and everyone is going through. This is a replacement with someone who will be on par with Breyer in terms of sensibilities, in terms of approach to the law, um, appointed by a, a uh, Democratic president and liberal leaning. So it's there's going to be net... Um, net gain, net loss, I guess I should say. Uh, I, I think we gain, obviously, in the choice, and we gain in that this is someone who is going to add longevity to the court, but it's a partisan pick. Uh, and that's what these have been for the ages. And that's why the fight for the balance of the courts has been the one fight that the Republicans have been honing in on for the past 30 years and the Democrats have failed and I mean failed miserably not um, so much so mm -hmm. the president who actually ended up in office but I mean as voters we we stayed home many times when we shouldn't have thinking that it really didn't matter well aren't we finding out now I mean with the 6-3 court with um, Mitch McConnell being able to essentially steal right steal seats and steal the balance of power by refusing to give a rightful nominee under President Obama, Merrick Garland, now Attorney General Merrick Garland, um, refusing to even give an audience of a vote. So these are things that happened on our watch because we did not do the one thing that we have the power to do, and that's vote. And because of it, we're watching even that vote be up under attack. So... It, it all matters. It all matters. And yes, if you if you put someone in office in the presidency and they want certain policies to pass, they're not going to go and pick someone that has their complete opposite ideology. It's just not going to happen. That's just not the game. All right, Monique, there have been 115 Supreme Court justices in the history of the United States, and 108 of them have been white men. Four have been white women, and there's been two black men and one Latina woman. First, why do you think it's taken this long to get a black woman on the bench, and what does it mean for others who come after? The black woman is the most disrespected, right? She's the least protected. I mean, all I can do is quote Malcolm on this, uh, and, and we see that in every lane. We see where we end up dead last. We're last to get every single advance and appointment, including our vote, including our vote. So this is not any different than that. Um, and it, it has nothing to do with our intelligence or with our academic prowess or with our ability to own businesses or with our ability to affect marketplace, our leadership skills. It has nothing to do with any of that. It really is just a day one stigma it is vestiges of slavery that we are living with to this common day. And if you look at it, Yodit, I mean, more of us are educated. We're educated at educated a higher percentage yep. than any other racial grouping, right? We have more businesses. We spend more in economy. We're it. We're it. And, and people know it. And they've been fighting us. And, and we've been winning. And so we're just going to keep winning with Black women. Win with Black women. Well, Monique That's my hashtag. 
And we're going to keep winning and we keep saving. Uh, Monique, I'm running up on a commercial break, but we're going to continue this conversation about the impending history that will be made when the first black woman is confirmed as a Supreme Court justice. We're back with more on the historic shift of the highest court in the land once the first black woman is confirmed to the United States Supreme Court. Trial attorney and crisis manager Monique Presley is still with me. Monique, I mentioned earlier that one of the potential nominees, Judge Kentanji Brown, um, was confirmed to the D.C. Court of Appeals. So she's already gone through the process of being questioned by the Senate and also has received bipartisan support as well. Um, explain for viewers how the confirmation process works for a Supreme Court nominee. Uh, how it used to work or where we are now. So as President Biden explained earlier today, he's not going to take a long time, but he's not going to rush it either. Uh, so he wants to seek the advice of um, the Senate in picking whoever the eventual nominee is going to be. So he is going to open the door for conservative members uh, of Congress to have a say and weigh in on who of his nominees they are looking at or his potential nominees and Dems will have the same thing and the short list will get shorter and shorter. It's my understanding, at least in years past, I know it to be true, that there were multiple after vetting that sat down and had conversations with the president or had conversations by phone. And it, what's something that people don't know is that uh, Katanji Brown Jackson was, it's my understanding, one of the two last people in the room when President Obama was getting ready to select his nominee and ultimately went with Merrick Garland. So she not just has been recently confirmed, but she has gone way down the road in the vetting process for this very job. Uh, so once that is done, then there are meetings between the uh, the nominee, whomever that is, and members of Congress. There are sit down meetings, and then it goes to uh, the floor for hearing and for vote. And all of that is an open process and procedure. Some of you have seen what a nightmare it can be when there are issues. We know what happened with Clarence Thomas. We know what happened more recently with Kavanaugh. We've seen what happened when people ended up not being able to pass muster, such, such as Borg. Uh, and I don't expect that there will be anything like that with whomever this black woman is, because as you've already said, Yadit, this person is beyond squeaky clean, beyond qualified, and there are no skeletons they can rake and rake and shake and shake. And all they're going to end up saying is, look, I see a black woman. And for that, they will be exposed. But no, I don't expect that there will be any defectors from uh, the Democrat side of the camp. And if there are defectors from the Republican side, frankly, doesn't matter. We've got the 50 plus the one. So that brings me to my next question, because, I mean, listen, Republicans, uh, they play dirty and they know all the tricks and they use the tricks to their advantage. Um, but President Biden says that he expects to name his pick by the end of February. And Senate Majority Leader um, Chuck Schumer says the nominee will be considered and confirmed with, quote, all deliberate speed. Now, back in 2020, Republicans changed the Senate rules so that they could confirm Justice Amy Coney Barrett before the elections. Monique, is there any way that the Republicans can delay confirmation? Um, no. I mean, whatever it is they try, the fact of the matter is that we, at least right now, have the majority. Majority in House, majority in Center. Uh, Senator Leader Schumer is the one who's making the rules, not uh, Minority Leader McConnell. And so whatever funny business they try, and they may, but I really think that they may want to sit this one out because there will simply be no way to justify it, whether they like it or not, that a black woman is being chosen. Um, every constitutional scholar has long since weighed in and said there is nothing illegal about this. There is no abuse of power in it. So there aren't any procedural stops that I see that they can do. I don't put anything past them, um, but you know what? They will get what they get if they try. <laughs> well, the Republican National Committee um, put out a statement today slamming Biden's potential nominees 
as an activist judge. Uh, the statement also says that, quote, the RNC will do everything in our power to expose Biden's Supreme Court nominee and hold Senate Democrats accountable in November for their votes. Again, this is before a nominee has even been selected. Monique, what do you make of this, this term, um, activist judge? Well, see, I mean, if we're black, we're activists, right? I mean, that's the way that is. And then from the list uh, of the ones that everyone is saying were on the short list, whether they are or whether they aren't, we don't know. But look, we've got a former federal public defender. We've got someone who's been in charge of sentencing commission. We've got um, these women who have been really in the way, doing good trouble for a very long time. These are GOP worst nightmares uh, for sure. And, and so, yes, if you call someone who cares about the plight of um, civil rights in this country, then it's going to be any one of these. If you want someone who's actually experienced as a trial lawyer, I love that part, it's going to be a few of these. I mean, these, these are mm -hmm. lawyers, lawyers, and judges, judges. So uh, there is much to celebrate. And anytime there's a lot for us to celebrate, well, of course. I mean, how do they say expose the nominee when they don't even know who the nominee is? It's absurd. It's absurd. So we talked about the top three candidates that uh, President Biden may be considering for, for this lifetime appointment. Monique, you said that you'd be supportive of any of these potential nominees that are presumed to be on Biden's list. Oh, absolutely. Because if you look at it, and I'm sure that you've probably already discussed this on another show, so far in terms of the nomination, the selection committee that has been assisting President Biden, uh, along with the input of Vice President Harris thus far, the judicial nominees have been stellar. And there have been, we know, eight Black women more than any other administration combined. Uh, so they are doing a good job of this. They know what they're doing. And they're not going to come and pull anything just random out of the woodworks and try to shove it down people's throats. This is going to be the creme de la creme. I mean, this is going to be our excellence. So if it's not, and I'm not even, I'm not even saying, do, do I have druthers about that list? Do I have some that I have, I, I've got some that I have a relationship with. I've got some I've appeared in front of. Um, and, and so, no, I am hands off and in spirit of unity and in spirit of support of my president who said that he would do this and now he's doing it. Mm -mm. Not that I, that I think I can ruffle any feathers or make for any problems or any dissension with, with my one voice, but my voice will not do that. I don't care if she's Harvard educated or Howard educated. I don't care if she worked as a prosecutor or worked as a defense attorney. I don't care if she's already on the bench or if she's never served. Come with excellence and I am backing it, period. Rooting, rooting for everybody black, and in this case, rooting for any of the uh, potential nominees on this list. Uh, Moni, quick question. All black everything. Um, do you think all that there should everything. be all black everything? Um, do you think that there should be term limits with Supreme Court justices? <sighs> no, I, I don't. Um, I, I think not knowing when a, a justice is going to leave the bench aids the stability of the legislative process and the judicial process and kind of the way that they are supposed to work uh, checking each other. And I think that as much as it is partisan now, it will be even more so if the uh, political side candidates can pick and choose when they're running, who they're nominating, all based on this is going to happen. Like if we knew that this year in June, Breyer was going to be done, then all hell would have already broken loose with the Republicans trying to pull everything out of the woodworks they can. I think that kind of the unknown of that and the lack of feeling that a justice has to be in a hurry to make their mark within a particular period of time, all of those things work in our favor. You haven't asked me, but I'll answer you. I do believe that the court should be expanded. I do believe that, they, that, that the GOP uh, stole 
and corrupted the process and that the only way that there will be balance for the sake of civil rights, for the sake of the climate, for the sake of democracy is if we garner enough control to be able to add uh, spots to to the bench because the situation that we are in now, even as happy as we are going to be about this black woman, we are going to see some dire, dire times with the decisions that are coming before the court. Monique Presley, your insight on this on this topic is just much needed and, and I appreciate your time and your perspective. Um, and thank you for coming on tonight. Appreciate you.